Welcome to another Zoom with a view uh, brought to you by the Antisemitism Policy Trust and the government's independent advisor on antisemitism, Lord Mann. Um, today, we're not joined by Lord Mann as expected. Um, he sends his apologies. He's on a train that has got stuck, but more than capable and some would say superior host, Ruth Smeath, uh, is with us. We're delighted to have Ruth, a trustee of the Antisemitism Policy Trust, former member of Parliament, Stoke-on-Trent North, uh, CEO of Index on Censorship and a good friend. Uh, she'll be interviewing our special guest, David Badil. David, as those who are joining us will know, is a cultural icon in Britain and indeed across the world, an accomplished comedian, author, screenwriter and television presenter. His shows are magnificent. His books, as my children can attest to, are wonderful. Um, his children's books. Uh, and we're grateful, David. Thank you for being here on World Book Day. So both of you presumably have World Book Day costumes prepared as well. <laughs> um, yeah. so, uh, will anybody from the audience who has a question put it in the Q&A, but I will otherwise pass to Ruth um to start putting the questions to david thank you i've gone with my regular costume of middle-aged jewish man <laughs> Excellent. Uh, which always works for me <laughs> uh, joined by a middle-aged jewish woman so we're, uh, yeah. we're all right for this um yeah. i think it's unfair to say you know that um uh losing john man but this is different now i think for us to have a chat about your book which by the way i thank love you and pre-ordered everyone who hasn't bought it go and buy it it is a i'm going to say this with love and respect to everybody that has written a book about anti-semitism it's an easy read it's a sad read at points it's thought-provoking um but you can start it with a position of base knowledge as opposed to having to actually know the historical understandings of anti-semitism so everyone go and buy the book um it's short as well it's short. short. Look at this. Look, look. It's like basically it's an essay book, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a good read because of it. Yeah. And, and what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, if it was a walloping great thing, including the very, very long and complicated history of anti-Semitism, as you say, it would be four times the size. Yeah, about so, hundred times the size, wouldn't it? Yeah. But what it does mean, and especially, I mean, we'll talk about the book in lots of different ways, but especially for the people who are being critical of the book, having not read it, there was, there's no excuse not to read it. Hmm. The people who yeah, pushed back on the title. Yeah, um, I mean, but, you know, well, we could talk about that, but actually it's, the response has been brilliant. I mean, yeah. you know, you can go to echo chambers on Twitter and, and see, uh, you know, negativity about it. But overall, uh, I, I am really chuffed by the response it's got in general, the um, way that, um, you know, well, we can talk about it, but the way the different, the Jewish people reacted in one way and a lot of progressive and sort of left wing people who perhaps didn't understand exactly why Jewish people were upset or offended or angry about the way things had gone in, in the Labour Party and other parts of the left in the last sort of 20 years have said to me that they do understand, not everyone, trust me, it hasn't, it hasn't unlocked the key for everyone, but it, I have had that response so I I am really pleased at um, most of the response I've got and some of the responses have been so incredibly lovely so yeah had some really lovely messages oh yeah the social media can be such a horrible platform but actually some of the things you've been able to share have been yeah well, it's the hope element of this because there's been hope missing but let's talk well, actually, about when you wrote it sorry I mean yeah sorry we're just having a chat now yeah here we are for everyone's but, to but Sarah Silverman tweeted about yeah. it yesterday and then she direct messaged me to say that this that exactly what you just said which is that she feels that there's a hope which in a very jewish way i can tell that she's saying it in a slightly pessimistic way but well, she still feels it <laughs> yeah. that her hope is that the book will finally what she said is create jewish allies that this idea of allyship that obviously on uh the left, although what I prefer to call progressives because I think it takes in a whole uh, political spectrum that isn't just the professional left, but the progressives feel themselves they need to be allies in, in intersectionality across across minorities and not just racial minorities, but, you know, to gender minorities and to disabled people or whatever, which is great, but that she was saying, where are the Jewish allies? Uh, and this book might create some. And I thought that's a really brilliant way of putting it. It is. And for those of us that have had strange experiences over the last five years, the it was that I think one of the things that I really like in the book is where you not like, but 
can really uh, empathize with is the silence mm. when you talk about you know the silence of where it's been missing about anti-semitism and where people would be very brave about other kinds of racism but don't seem to recognize that when anti-semitism is right in front of them that's the same yeah um, well actually on that note um so the book is quite it's short but it's quite nuanced and quite complex in some of its ideas and i see misunderstandings of it in strange places so actually the book so this might help just to get properly started <laughs> it seems to have just started chatting in the middle of the conversation but um it was originally commissioned by the times literary supplement um who uh, do a series of essay books and most of these are fairly literary so lee child who writes big thrillers wrote one called the hero which is an essay book about uh, his concept of what a hero is and they asked me to do one and uh, i said i actually want to do a more sort of political one about this subject which is about the neglect the absence exactly what you're talking about the silence of uh people who consider themselves to be anti-racist or in anti-racist discourse the silence and the ambigu ambiguity and the stifling at times of you know support for jews when they're faced with anti-semitism or whatever uh, so they said fine, and it was originally meant to be 10,000 words, it ended up as, as uh, 30,000 words. Um, but, um, an ex yeah, so I was going to tell you an example of how it's misunderstood is that uh, an extract was published in the TLS. Mm -hmm. And it begins the book, for anyone who hasn't read it, with a series of examples of what I'm talking about, which is this progressive silence, absence, neglect, which is different from what you might call traditional anti-Semitism from the far right, which is a very straightforward, in a way it doesn't need a book about it, so it doesn't need a book deconstructing it, which is just we hate Jews, we own it, we want to kill Jews, that's very straightforward. This is a much more subtle and, you know, not explicit type of anti-Semitism that I'm talking about. So it begins with a series of examples of those, and two of them I use were critiqued by a letter in the TLS today, misunderstanding them slightly. So one of them I talk about is I was listening to the BBC on Radio 4, uh, having Jeremy Irons read out in 2017 all of T.S. Eliot's poetry, like throughout the day. And anyone who knows T.S. Eliot's poetry will know that it includes extremely anti-Semitic stuff, including the lines, the rats are underneath the piles, the Jew is underneath the lot. And I also talk about, this is the other example this book brings up in the TLS in this letter, the fact that there was a production of The Colour Purple by by Alice Walker, in which a young black actress was uh, cancelled, if you like, from being in that because she had posted homophobic um, things because she's a religious person and she posted these very kind of evangelical stuff about, um, you know, marriage, whatever, that was offensive to gay people. And she was sacked out of that production. But no one even mentioned the fact that Alice Walker has written some very anti-Semitic poetry. No one even worries about that. And that's not even helpful into question. And so this bloke said, this bloke wrote a letter saying, well, I don't see what's absent about, about the anti-Semitism in, in Alice Walker's poetry or in T.S. Eliot's poetry. What's they talking about? And he's misunderstanding where I see the absence. The absence is not in Alice Walker or T.S. Eliot. When T.S. Eliot says the rats underneath the pile, the Jew is underneath the lot, he's being directly anti-Semitic. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that Radio 4 will read out that poetry in 2017 and there won't be a murmur. That's where the silence is. You know, it, you have to imagine the outcry if similar negative stereotypes of yeah, another yeah. minority were expressed in poetry on New Year's Day on the BBC, what you'd hear on Twitter, what you'd hear in the newspapers, what you'd hear, you know, el elsewhere. That's what I'm talking about by the absence. The absence isn't in the poetry, it's in the reaction. And I think when we keep seeing it, so even when, you know, the, the, actually, let me go back to the book, because we could go on the journey of, you know, anti-Semitism and contemporary anti-Semitism that even in the last two weeks, there have been such stark examples of. But let's step back. Why did you write the book? I mean, I get you, you, were, you could have written on anything. You are David <laughs> Deal. So why did you write the book? Well, I have been writing disparately about this subject for quite a long time, actually. Um, so to, in terms of you, you know, it, it, it's probably important to say that although you're a very good example of a sort of somebody who suffered directly from anti-Semitism in the Labour Party over the last five years, and the book does have stuff about that, I think it goes back much longer than that as a malaise, as a misunderstanding. I mean, it goes back, I would say, centuries, but I've been writing about it 
since about 2002 and 2011, I wrote an article for the Telegraph called How Anti-Semitism Entered the Zeitgeist. And that was when Galliano, you remember the Galliano, the fashion designer, uh, was caught on camera saying unbelievably anti-Semitic things. And in the same year, uh, you know, you had Charlie Sheen said something very anti-Semitic about someone who'd worked. And you had this weird thing where people you don't think of as, you know, from the right as sort of, you know, obviously near Nazis, sort of cool people, if you like, <laughs> saying these anti-Semitic things. And that was what I was trying to define was like, you have to not just look to people wearing swastikas to find this stuff. And then you have to look at what the reaction is. As I say, the fact that Galliano is given a bit of a slap on the wrist, but then immediately sort of, you know, his next show is on like a year later or whatever. And then that's what I wanted to talk about is what I talk in the book is a kind of hierarchy of racism, hierarchy of offense that I do perceive as existing within the discourse within the conversation about anti-racist. So the book is, you know, I think it says on the um, flap that it's really about people who consider themselves to be on the right side of history, which is now a very intense thing, isn't it? It's a very intense thing, especially online, but elsewhere that, you know, there's been an intensification of identity politics and of people wanting to say that they are outraged on behalf of other minorities or that they are part of a minority that, and as I say, not just ethnic minorities, but all sorts of minorities. Um, and I feel that somehow or other, in a way, the oldest racism or the oldest form of discrimination has somehow got uh, lost in this. And then the book examines why that is. And there are, it can't be put down to one reason, but the overarching reason and this is where the book becomes very complicated because I think this actually does come from traditional anti-Semitism, but at some level it's accepted by left-wing anti-Semitism, if you want to call it left-wing, that Jews are privileged and powerful and, you know, not deserving of the protections that other minorities need because Jews are rich, basically. And that's a myth created by traditional far-right anti-Semitism. And yet it's very deeply believed, and I have spoken to very right on for want of a better word people i mean a friend of mine and i'm not gonna say who this is but he's a very right on person when and as i say i have been active in doing things so one of the things i tried to do in 2010 which is talked about in the book is i tried to raise awareness about the fact that at football people chant this word which i decided to call the y word and calling it the y word i'm going to say the word year as opposed to the word year is part of the project of saying let's try and not think that this word, this hate word for Jews is somehow lesser than the other hate words, which we now have to call by the N word or the P word, right? We've decided that those are uh, unacceptable words. Why is this word somehow sayable and chanted at football matches? And, you know, without getting into the whole thing about the ownership of that word by Tottenham Hotspur, which is not in fact what I was, what I was raising the issue for about at all. It's much more about that disparity of offense, or whatever. So this very right on person says to me, and it's this story is in the book, but the Y word isn't as bad as the P word or the N word. And I said, why not? And he just said, because Jews are rich, which is sort of an extraordinary thing to say if there are a thousand reasons that it's just something he accepts. And in a way, my point in the book is, you know, A, that's a myth, B, it's dangerous, C, the data doesn't bring it out, but it doesn't matter. No. You know, even if you believe the the complicated, not factually correct idea that Jews are somehow more economically secure than other ethnic minorities, which they're not, you know, they're not more secure than many others, uh, particularly, but racism, as we all know, at its most powerful, which it quickly becomes and, and exists as in many parts of the world, is has very little bearing on material security. My grandparents, as I say in the book, were very, very rich, as far as I know, in Germany, um, and it counted for nothing because they lost it all and most of their family was murdered. And it's weird, we exist in this culture which, even though we're not Marxists the way that we think, so much of how we think is influenced by that. It's like, well, that's all that really counts is material circumstances. No, it isn't. History proves that that is not the case. So anyway, so anyway yeah. that's a long thing. There are lots of other reasons. Israel's very important in the discussion, how people think about Israel. It all ties into this idea of Jews as somehow powerful and the oppressor. I think that the confusion about whether Jewishness is a religion rather than ethnicity is very important. But the key element is that. The key element is that Jews are powerful and privileged and not victims in the same way that other minorities are considered to be by, as I say, progressives. 
I think you know, one of the most shocking moments for me over the last five years was hearing a member of the PLP who's in the House of Lords, so you know, he's truly the establishment, um, and he's Jewish, and he always has a backpack with him because his parents were survivors, but in his backpack is his passport and cash in three different, different denominations. And right. he is saying that, and he, he told us all, as he sat in the, House of, in the House of Commons as a member of the House of Lords, because that fear was always going to be there for him because of his family experiences. And it comes back to the fact that, you know, even, if, even for those Jews who are wealthy, it means nothing because... Yeah. You know, the the reality our lived our shared lived reality in our memory has been such well more, i mean my mother was born in nazi germany i mean that's the thing is i think you know, the book talks about this as well uh, a sense slightly amongst progressives of, of you know stop going on about it the holocaust or whatever and as a result of that i talk about other types of hate crime against jews that are much more current or whatever but it's impossible to dismiss that because it's so in living memory you know there's you know as i say my mother uh, no longer with us but my mother was dispossessed and most of her family were murdered therefore my family were murdered and the effects of that live in me that's the, one of the key things to understand is it's not past that that trauma and that damage and indeed that dispossession continues you know within me my mother had a terrible terrible early life which screwed her up in all sorts of ways you know, she's an amazing and brilliant woman, but she was mad. And, and her father, who was, you know, really suffered uh, and was in D Dachau after Crystal now, he was in and out of a mental hospital his entire life, you know. And so the idea that, yeah, but, you know, that was a long time ago. It doesn't, it's not true. And it's also ridiculously ahistorical, which I think happens a lot, which is sort of this sense of like, oh, well, you know, that was one thing, but we need to shine a light on other things. And we do. Um, I think we do, but it's completely ahistorical to imagine that history is past. No, it, I completely agree. Okay, so I'm going to go for the hope bit. What do we do? You've written a well, book. It's an interesting thing, that, because, because a lot of people have said to me, oh, I like your book loads, which is nice. And then they say, but, you know, what's the way out? Or other people have said to me, you know, it's sort of, do you want... All this sort of very very hair trigger identity politics that you're saying exists but doesn't exist for jews so you want it to exist for jews and a slight part of me says well the book is not a roadmap you know it's not a manifesto it's an analysis it's a it's analysis of how things are my views on how we got here and why we got here and why people think differently for jews and blah blah, blah. but it doesn't really say so therefore we should do this i mean there are one or two things i absolutely deeply believe uh, and one of them is people need to understand that Jews are an ethnic minority, right? That's one of the one of the things I do believe. Are you sure? Because the BBC were, yeah. you know, questioning but, that last week. But do you know that's to do with the book and that's to do with them not understanding the book, right? Yeah. It is. That's the book shifting the dial, I have to say. Because, so, um, you'll have to remind me of the name of the uh, Scottish Labour Party person who, uh, the person of colour who's now... Anna uh, Sauer. Sorry? Anna, Anna Sauer. Yeah, so Anna Sauer became the first... Labour Party person of a first UK political leader of colour over the weekend, but he was described by various Labour Party people, Nalanja Rayner, as the first ethnic minority leader of a political party. And because I've written this book, I am now a flashpoint <laughs> for that sort of thing. And hundreds of people were saying, Jews don't count. What, what do you think about this? Blah blah blah. So eventually, I said. Uh, I think I retweeted Andrew Rayner and said Ed Miliband so quickly forgot. And then <laughs> I said and Disraeli and yeah, Herbert yeah. Samuel and, and all that kind of stuff. And so then what happened was actually Politics Live in contact with me and said, do you want to come on and talk about this? And I said, no, because the book is really complicated and nuanced and I'm trying to get the message out there. And I don't want to be distracted by the idea that I'm somehow doing down and with Sawa who I think it's great that he's the first person of colour to be the head of a political party. I don't want that to become the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, well, we won't talk about that, right, they got, they did it for, in the last eight minutes of the programme, they got Ben Cohen, who, you know, I think he's the CEO of Pink News, who's Jewish, on to talk about it. But then they put him in this weird position where it's him and four non-Jews, and underneath, if they write, should Jews count as an ethnic minority, which is so 
excuse me, fucked yes. and wrong. And Joe Coburn, who hosts that programme and is Jewish, yes. I'm, I'm direct messaging her and say, why have you done it like this? And she said, well, we're just trying to make the same points in, as in your book. I said, no, you're not. Or at least if you are, you're completely messaging it wrong. That message, if you want to make the same points as my book, then you want to put a message that says, why do some people not accept that Jews are an ethnic minority? Yeah. You don't put, should Jews count as an ethnic minority? That is completely misunderstanding my book, or at least the optics are. So <laughs> that's what I mean about like, you know, the book is complex and nuanced. And the issue of Jewishness is complex and nuanced. A lot of people don't understand what Jewishness is or what anti-Semitism is. One reason I wrote the book to go back to your question is a very simple one, which is, I have a lot of left-wing friends. I'm basically from that political camp myself. And during the time of Jeremy Corbyn, Jason Manford, for example, lovely bloke, Jason Manford, but a lifelong Labour Party, is texting me to say, I don't understand. How can we be of the left and racist? It's not possible, is it? Please explain it to me. And so that's what I'm trying to do in this book. I'm saying it's complicated, but yes, you can. Not you personally, Jason Manford, but yes. <laughs> There is, there is a conversation on the left, which, uh, you know, if you break it down, it's anti-Semitic. And so that's why I wrote the book, to try and help those people understand. Just need you to look at my social media feed for like a day. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I mean, one thing that's worth saying, Ruth, which obviously applies to you, is, is how I don't know how much of this conversation we would be having, how much of the book would, would be written or not without social media. Yeah. I mean, you know, the book's got a lot in it about social media, and I, I think at one point I apologise to people who have never been on Twitter. But, you know, social media is responsible for a lot of the increase in anti-Semitism, the increase in all sorts of extremism or whatever. At the same time, it's not, you know, you can't then dismiss it. It's like, well, this is only happening on Twitter because unfortunately, for better or worse, that is where the conversation about politics and how we live now mainly happens. And it really does affect how we live now and it really affects you know the way that people are treated and I personally think which is a whole other conversation the levels of anger and rage and hatred in society have been massively raised by everyone being on social media and arguing about that stuff all the time in a very binary way so yes so but I know that you're you've had terrible stuff on on uh, social media I mean I, there is an example it's not you is it it's Lu uh, Luciana Ber Berger I use an example of a good example of that absence do you, do you remember that bit in the book yeah so there's a bit in the book where um i am talking about luciana berger getting a terrible racist abuse about shekels and whatnot that she's getting and i uh use the example of how you know when diane abbott gets terrible abuse people on the left and progressives immediately come out and support her and they weren't doing that with luciana berger or whatever and i just said it should be seen as as bad and then Diane Abbott retweeted what I'd said, but what she said was that the abuse of women in public life was appalling and should be stopped. And the point I make about that is, yeah, but you know what you've done there is you've all lives mattered it because yeah. you've missed out the anti-Semitism. You've made it just about the abuse of women in general, which obviously is terrible, but at the same time, you've done a thing which is to say, I'm just gonna ignore the Jewish element of this. I think the one thing that, I mean, because there's been a lot of debate over the last couple of weeks about solidarity and the hierarchy of racism and who supported who, which is all nonsense, in my opinion. But one of the things that was so painful about the last five years, and he's touched on, and Luciana is both a wonderful and a heartbreaking example of it, is that a lot of the abuse came within from within our own family. So I get, I, yeah, I get far right extremism. I mean, as a given, right? Yeah. Expect it. The reason why this was so painful and why your book is so important, it's much worse when it's from your own side. Mm. And it's much worse. It's not just so it's the, and there's a combination of factors. The fact it was some of the, that the anti-Semitism was coming from the left, the silence from the people who you, who you assumed would have your back, and the fact that it was then dismissed. So we had sort of a multi- factor of and absolutely women get a lot of abuse but the Jewish women were getting abuse from within the Labour Party and that was different that is different yeah. and also just the difference is the point is that like you know as I say in the book you know it is to some extent the, the left's all lives matter it is to say we're against anti-semitism and all types of racism yeah. because yes okay you are but 
as Black Lives Matter have pointed out correctly, to say all lives matter is to ignore the specificity and the particular problems that are faced by black people, you know, you know, with the police or whatever else it might be. They're, those are specific problems that not all people face. Similarly, there are specific types of anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish racism that not all people face. And just blindly saying, yes, we're against all types of racism is not is ignoring that. It really, really is. Um, Okay, we're getting a couple of questions through, but before I move on to those, I, I've got a couple of questions that are more from me. You've had a lot of feedback about the book. Um, what's been the, what, the one that's most surprised you? You've had some really like, lovely, Stephen Fry's um, comments to you were just beautiful. Yeah. What's been the one that's made you go, oh? Uh, well, there's been one or two. I don't, I don't know, I can't give you the names, partly because I probably shouldn't, but also because I can't remember them, but, but but there was a woman who set who wrote something and about how the book had really shocked her and how particularly she was upset by the football stuff or whatever. And uh, I said thank you or whatever. But then Linda Grant, you know, the Jewish novelist, direct messaged me to say that woman is a died in the wall Corbynista. Um, and you know, that's amazing that she's saying that. Um, I mean, I got Mike Lee wrote to me yesterday and I didn't really know this, but Mike Lee is like a big supporter of Corbyn and, uh, you know, supported Chris Williamson, I think, and stuff. And I got a few Jewish people not happy or, or sort of uncertain about that. Uh, you know, I, to be honest with you, I haven't asked him the details of why he likes the book. I haven't said, right, so have you rethought your position or whatever? I just am pleased that he likes the book. You know, and, uh, you know, the, the book has been as I say, taken in lots of different ways, although I think the basic message is clear. Um, and I would say the reaction from Jewish people has been mainly, actually two reactions from Jewish people. One is, the most common one is, thank Christ, someone has said this stuff at last yeah. and has articulated it so clearly and concise concisely and many things that I've sort of thought, but maybe not actually articulated. That's the primary one. The second one, actually, slightly more surprisingly, is quite a lot of Jewish people saying, I don't really talk about being Jewish. I am kind of ashamed of it. I mean, they may not, actually, they have said that. I've had a few saying that, or certainly saying things like, I've always been a bit embarrassed, I've always been a bit frightened. I read your book, now I feel I could speak about it more. So that's really great. And then I get um, quite a lot, quite a lot. I mean, obviously, these are things sent directly to me. So in general, they're, they're, they're nicer ones of progressive people saying, you know, I had one today. Uh, I'm going to read it out to you. See if I can read it out to you, which is, this is the dream reaction from a progressive person, but I have to find it on my Twitter feed. Just bear with me. Um, hang on. The stuff about my children's books and Bake Off and all that. All right, here we go. This guy, Rufus, said, unapologetic final shout out for Appadil's Jews Don't Count, takes apart positions I flirt with 20 years ago then refuses to let me off the hook by nailing ongoing biases I've just learned to suppress I mean that's brilliant I think yeah. because that is a genuine person you know challenged by the book and rethinking his assumptions or whatever and then of course I've had the odd you know vile pushback from some people on the far crank left I believe Judas did some horrible review of it which you know what can you expect <laughs> I mean, the thing about Judas doing a horrible review of it, right, which I haven't read, but I think, yeah, who am I going to believe about my book? Uh, a, a tiny amount of Jews who bet on very much the wrong horse with Jeremy Corbyn or Stephen Fry. <laughs> uh, those, those are my choices there. Uh, it's hard right. to know who, who to go with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, but, gen but in general, it's been really, really, you know, as I say, very nice. Um, and... The best thing, I think, is for people who are coming to the book without that kind of bad faith, we want to not listen to this, I want to trash it or whatever, is I have had a sense, which doesn't happen much on social media, that people are coming to it with open minds, you know, that they are, because the book does take you on a bit of an intellectual and emotional journey, and you have to be prepared to go on it. And if you're like, no, which sometimes you get on the left of like, I'm right, mm -hmm. I'm, I, I'm morally pure, then you won't go on that journey but people are going on it yeah i i i really enjoyed that the uh 
I'm right and I don't care what your lift experience has actually been. Yeah. <laughs> if you've not actually you've not done it. Yeah, it's still ongoing that. I mean, you know, and some of the argue I mean I I actually try and get involved in arguments less now on social media than I used to. I, I did a show called, which I'm going to start doing again once the pandemic is over, called Trolls Not the Dolls, which is about rage on social media. So I was engaging quite a lot for material, but now I do it less. And I, but I see arguments going, ongoing from someone who is not of your political stripe, Danny Finkelstein, yeah. uh, is I... an unbelievably big supporter of the book. I mean, he loves the book and disagrees with some things in the book, disagrees with the position on Israel and whatever, but really loves the book. And I watch him on Twitter, you know, dealing with these people. Jackie Walker, he was dealing with the other day, you know, Jackie Walker, who I think was yeah. by the party and says that Jews are partly responsible for the slave trade and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But he's it's brilliant in a way that he's, I mean, I'm not prepared to take those people on anymore. I can't be doing with it, but he, he is prepared to do it. No, but when you were doing it and you still do, but when you were doing it, it was with, you had people's backs when they needed, when they desperately needed it. So and yeah. I think that, and I'm not the only one that will be forever grateful for that. Um, okay. The other, the only other thing, cause we have talked a lot about social media. Yeah. Um, and you do touch on it on the book, but um, you're, social media description is Jew. Yeah. Now, lots of people who aren't Jewish won't even use the word Jew because yeah. yeah, they're not quite sure of. So mm. why is it Jew? Because you are so much more, I mean, I think one of the things that would be both of us have done anti-Semitism and anti-racism stuff periodically through our careers, but we're so much more than just Jews. <laughs> so Yeah. I mean, as I say in the book, I talk about it in the book, it's primarily funny. Yeah. I think there's something funny about just saying that about myself as my biography. And it, I know it's funny because it gets a laugh when I've said it on stage. Uh, most of my stage shows now have got, I use um, a you know, PowerPoint. And in my last show, I just had it on stage and it just gets a laugh. And it's partly the liberation of that, of sort of just saying, I'm going to use that word and not be worried about it. But there is a more com complex thing going on, which is, yeah, I'm, I don't have Jewish shame. I, I don't have it at all. I mean, I basically don't have shame as a person. <laughs> I'm like genetically incapable of it. So as a result, I don't have Jewish shame. It's never occurred to me for a second to not be as out about being Jewish as I want to be. And that then confuses people because I'm completely unreligious. I mean, totally atheist, but very out about being Jewish. It's all confusing for non-Jews who don't understand all that. But the other thing is, that, and I talk about this in the book, is it's a very complicated word and this idea that people think it's an insult and it sort of is an insult but it's only it's a weird type of insult because most slang words for minorities are slang words and they get reclaimed by that minority yeah. and that we see that a lot with the way that black people or gay people or whoever have reclaimed the words that have been imposed on them or whatever but Jew is what we are it's in the OED and it's for me a very interesting example of the very deep structural racism that exists in Judeo-Christian cultures that just the word itself is an insult. And I actually quote a bit from another book of mine called The Secret Purposes, where someone is translating, uh, a, uh, an English person is translating a Nazi's words and the Nazi uses the word Udinen and she translates it as Jewess and then she realises that's not contemptuous enough. That doesn't quite how she meant it. And then she realizes Jew women. That's how she's uh, Jew women. But if she were to write Jewish women, that doesn't get the Nazis con contempt in. And so what is it? What other word is it that you add just a suffix ish to it and it, ch it changes it or you lose the suffix, it changes it. And so that power, I'm trying to get all that to reshift it and rethink it just by, you know, using that as my biography. Well, it's like Jew ish. Yeah, but I, I, I always prefer to call myself Jew, a Jew. I, I hardly ever say, oh, I'm a Jewish person. And I hardly ever refer to Jewish people. I, li I think just say Jews, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's part of my out and proudness, even though, but I don't think of it like that. I just, because I don't, I so don't have shame. <laughs> I don't think of myself as coming out of the closet. I've never been in any fucking closet about it. But so I'm really happy with the word Jew. Well, I think there's a, I mean, my mother would have killed me if she thought that I was ashamed of being Jewish. And I was brought up in, you know, we ate bacon. I mean, I, when I was uh, doing my, um, uh, when I started, I, I took us to synagogue when I was 11, because my mum had sort of, 
not reacted against it, but she'd run away from her Judaism because she'd married a non-Jewish bloke. And so there was bacon sandwiches and prawns in my house when I was little and Christmas, which is, you know, then became a Hanukkah bush when I at 11 decided, discovered being Jewish. And well, I, I went to a Jewish primary school, very orthodox. I had to wear sit sit and a yarmulke and we kept kosher at school and had to do prayers and it was mainly Hebrew. But at home, I was having bacon and eggs for breakfast before I put on my sit sit and whatever. So it's, as ever with Jews, it's a confusing environment. Oh, so my, I've got this great story and she'll, she'll kill me if I ever meet her again. But my grandmother, who I was very close to, but she was the main um, cook at the Royal Majestic. So there was no one that had not been to a mitzvah in London that had not had my grandmother's chicken soup because she, right. she was sent, you know, she went every Sunday morning. She was allowed to turn on the gas by the rabbis. She was, you know, she was allowed, she was given all these special privileges because she'd been doing it for such a long time. And when we were sitting shiver for my grandfather, um, the rabbi, the minute the rabbi left, she turned around. It was one of the best moments of my life. She turned around and went, well, someone go and make me a bacon sandwich. <laughs> 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 every, this good little Jewish grandmother there yeah. <laughs> made kosher chicken soup every week. Love it. I, already though, already in my mind, I want your grandmother's chicken soup. Oh, she made the best chicken soup in the world. I mean, mine's not too bad. Like, it might be as I get older as well, but like, I can't watch telly now and if there's food, that's all I'm really thinking about is the <laughs> food. Like, there can be a sex scene going on, but there's a sandwich in the corner. I'm thinking, I want to know what, <laughs> what's wrong with me. I feel like that should take us to Great British Bake Off and you telling us, oh, are yeah. you allowed to tell us what you've baked? I'm not, I think I, I'm not allowed to, I'm allowed to say I'm in it now. Uh, and I'm yeah. allowed to tell you who I'm in it with because... I think people forget with Celebrity Bake Off, by the way, it's not a whole competition. It's only <laughs> one. Each show is a dis, is a, a single show and there's a winner of that show, but you don't go on like whatever. So I'm against James McAvoy, Kelly Holmes and oh, what's her name? Anne-Marie, who's a pop star. Um, and they're all, I mean, I will tell you, they're all very good bakers and I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but, but. Paul Hollywood, oh, I don't want to give too much away, Paul, but Paul Hollywood did quite like something I cooked, but I can't give too much away. No, I can't no. wait. But it was a real laugh. You know what? It was a real laugh. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, so, yeah. The only other person I know who did it was Jess Phillips, and she thoroughly enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got proper questions, and I have, you know, taken us on a journey, so let's ask about the... Um, um, okay. What do we do about Jews who buy into the language of denial and dismissal of left anti-Semitism? Uh, well, I don't know, really. I mean, uh, you, you know, there are some of those, not that many. I noticed that they are, you know, to use a word that the left uses quite a lot, they're weaponized quite a lot. Yeah. So uh, I noticed the other day someone was having a row about my book again. I was just watching it, not getting involved. On, online and I think they quoted the Judas review and then someone pointed out how what a sort of minority that they, they are within the community and then someone else said oh that person said right oh they're the wrong type of Jews and of course they're not the wrong type of Jews they have their opinion and that's their opinion uh, but I um, the book is you know it's hard to know what genre the book is in because it's a sort of polemic about it but there's quite a lot about me, quite a lot of stories or whatever. And there's some sort of, you know, social psychology in it. So one of the things I talk about is Jewish shame and how I think Jewish shame is sometimes linked to people, Jews who are on the far left, because I think they're so, they've so bought into the myth of Jewish privilege that they do think we have to constantly sort of, you know, accept all these ideas about Jews and all these ideas about Israel and whatever, uh, I, I, I'm hesitating to use the phrase self-loathing Jew because I think that's a complicated phrase, but I do think that that buying into the idea of Jewish privilege is, is quite prominent amongst Jews on the far left. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I always think this when people say, what shall we do about? I think, oh, I don't know. I'm just a comedian and a writer. I'm not a policymaker and I don't know. But I am, um, I mean, the answer is they should read my book and not dismiss it out of hand. <laughs> and think oh is this me that he's talking yeah. about um yeah i think that, that it's guilt and it's well you're you're more among or have been when you were an mp and when you were in the are you still a member of the labor party yeah okay yeah so do you go to meetings and stuff 
I do for my sins. <laughs> okay, so so you're you're more in the in the belly of the beast. I mean, you know, when you meet someone, do you meet those types of Jews that we're talking about, or my experience is rarely. I mean, I hate to say it out loud because I might inspire it, but um, apparently I've got a bit of a fearsome reputation. Who knew? Um, so if you've got, if you've got those views, or if you're an anti semite like, it's rare for someone to be brave enough. I think that's that would try and front it up because my immediate reaction would be so visceral, um, at least for those that know. I think one of the issues that um, it's been challenging, but- Yeah, I'm sure. Other, yeah, but the um, le- um, Jewish, the, the Jew, I, and then you end up with the whole thing because then it becomes such a, per- it's been so personal. All of this yeah. is so incredibly personal. Yeah. You sort of look at them and go, how can you just dis- my I mean my big issue is just because they're saying these things and they're providing cover to the racists, why would you think that these racists aren't going to turn on you? Mm. What yeah. cover do you think you're getting yourselves? Because trust me, that's true. I well, don't understand. You know, you've had, you know, I mean I have as well. I get lots of anti-Semitism and lots of whatever, but you get specific, or you did certainly as an MP, you got lots of specific stuff. There was one time actually I tweeted about you and I got Oh, who are they? Those people, I can't remember who it is now, but the sort of Navara people and whatever, yeah, yeah. having a go. Um, and do you have you met any of those people in, in real life or is it all on social media? Oh, so the the threats that, well, the abuse, they would see me and run away. So like uh, I have been in the same room as them. I have been, well, a, you know, a Labour Party conference. But one of the things that's been so strange for me is that I wasn't allowed by myself. So I'd not been, at, I, I, I was never in a position where it was just me for five years. It's like from the first death threats in 2016, there was always someone with me. So, um, and, and because there had to be, right? So there was never a, um, and they were, there was one person who came, <laughs> there was this, uh, I, was, I was running a by-election in Stoke-on-Trent and this racist woman came up to me um, and she'd obviously been writing about me online and she was a late party activist and she she, pre- she presented a paper to give to me <laughs> and about five but before I went to reply and would have been an appropriately reply five people appeared <laughs> like this, right. this really? tiny little racist and then all of these very big people arrived to get her away but I so think you I did about security you mean all the time all the... oh I wasn't um, I, I wasn't allowed um, on police record well, um I wasn't allowed to go on public transport for three years. Wow. So, yeah. That's bad. Uh, and it, so it was, I mean, because I got physical, I got like handwritten threats, unusual emails, the social media, but you're right, so much of it was on social media and you never knew. Yeah. You don't. Yeah. Well, I've, I've had stuff like that on social media, but I mainly, you know, ignore it. But I mean, you obviously, you and also you're out and about in that way. Yeah. especially as an MP canvassing and whatever you know it, that does make make you at risk anyway we should probably have more questions yeah, from yeah more questions from that yeah so um right you've touched on it and your views on Israel are quite well known but where does this crossover come I mean like this week you did put fuck Israel on Twitter I didn't so so people uh <laughs> I mean in response to it it's got nothing to do with no 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 I don't say that I, I don't put fuck, you know so I was talking about this just now to Frank Skinner as it happens. We just went for a walk and he asked me about that. I, 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 I don't say fuck Israel. What I say is stupid fucking Israel. And as I say in the book, and I know it's not clear on social media to people who've never come across it before, that isn't really even a comment on the country. And about the country, I am, as I describe myself in the book, a non-Zionist and a sort of non-Israel person. I just don't really have a very strong view about Israel, except as it intersects with anti-Semitism and how people use it, you know, as a cover for anti semitism or whatever. But in terms of the actual country, I don't think very much about it. And I think the notion that I should have a strong opinion either way is racist. So when I say stupid fucking Israel, what I'm mainly doing is talking about the endless, annoying, stupid fucking conversation you have to get into when you're trying trying to talk about anti-Semitism when people constantly bring up Israel. Yeah. So what I'm really saying is fuck off about stupid fucking Israel. That's what I mean. Leave me alone about Israel. I'm trying to talk about anti-Semitism. It's mainly a different thing, but you keep bringing it up. And to some extent as well, 
it's a I'm, I'm trying to I'm I'm not really saying that to Jews it's Jews who always get upset about it but I used it to talk about David Miller the other day. I was going to bring this on to yeah right well David Miller for anyone who doesn't know you probably do know who's listening to this but it's this Bristol academic who's who's a conspiracy theorist and an Assad apologist and all those things but also obviously you know massively anti-Zionist and has been saying recently that the Bristol JSOC, 18 year olds, and all JSOCs are basically pawns of the state of Israel and are trying to shut him down essentially because they're told to do so by Mossad. And that is actively dangerous, I think, to those young yeah. people and whatever. And I was trying to talk about how, you know, it, while I was tweeting against him, that my position is nothing to do with stupid fucking Israel, even though he's going on about Israel. I'm not interested really in Israel. I'm interested in what I perceive immediately to be anti-Semitism. And in a way, I put SF Israel in that for him. Not that he's necessarily reading it, but think about how confused <laughs> David Miller is going to be. I mean, you'll probably think, oh, he's a triple agent for Mossad, isn't he? That's why he's saying yeah. that. I'm sure that's what he'll think. <laughs> but that's why it's there. It's there so he can't say, oh, David Badil's only saying this because he's a Zionist which is the way his mind goes straight away. I think, you know, one of the, of all the offensive things he's said, and I find them abhorrent, but then I'm also chief executive of a free speech organisation. So this is this has been an interesting week in, turn, in my head for thinking about him. Although I think he's inciting violence in what he's saying about Jewish students and the power dynamic that those students have. But also the idea that we've got Zionist chicken soup. Yeah. I mean, who knew that was, like, we are so all powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Even our chicken soup. Well, I bought the chicken suit, which is probably not as good as your grandmother's, no. um, was uh, part of some interfaith event. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, as it happens, I first came across him. Um, obviously, I knew straight away that he would also have, you know, conspiracy theory and Jews and anti-Zionism at his heart. But it, there's a brilliant podcast about the White Helmets uh, by a woman called Chloe Hedger Maffei uh, for the BBC. Should, anyone should go and listen to it which is about the disinformation campaign about the White Helmets. And he's totally part of that, part of those that weird conspiracy theory, Syrian pro-Assad thing, who thinks that the White Helmets are basically, you know, all just actors. And anyone who thinks that about anything, anyone who thinks, I mean, as I've said many times, conspiracy theory is how in idiots get to feel like intellectuals, right? That's what it is. It's a bunch of clever sounding verbiage generally and made up idiotic theories that sound clever for people who are actually stupid uh, but what is al always the case i mean almost invariably is they are also anti-semites yeah. conspiracy theorists um so uh i don't quite know how we got there but that's in terms of me tweeting about him and trying to try what i'm trying to do is say okay this is what's anti-semitic here and it will get dragged into a conversation about Israel. But actually, actually, even though it seems to be all about Israel, for me, Israel is a side issue in this conversation. It's the targeting of Jews, of young Jews, under the notion that they are part of some all-powerful lobby. That's what I'm talking about. And there is, I mean, one of the things, regardless of, you know, I would spend every day of my life if I was in Israel campaigning against Netanyahu, but I shouldn't have to say that. I'm on the left. No, it would I, be a given. Yeah. But if I have, you know, if, if my own personal experiences have taught anything, is that Israel is now really important. A place, a safe place for Jews is actually really important in a way that I'd sort of hoped in my lifetime that wouldn't be a thing anymore. Yeah, I don't actually feel that. I'm sorry. I know lots no. of Jews who feel that. I don't particularly. Uh, I just... I, I just don't. I I, I can't. I'm just, I, don't, I can't. I just can't face the idea. Uh, maybe. Maybe I'm in denial. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that however bad things get, you know, we're not going to have to emigrate to Tel Aviv. Well, I'm not going because yeah, I think I'm, you know I'll stay and fight. But that's not. But the idea of it is important. But the yeah, idea of it. Clear now... about this. I mean, should be. I mean, this is a sort of different conversation. Even though I've written a whole book about left-wing anti-Semitism and, you know, progressive anti-Semitism or the way that Jews are missed out or whatever, I actually never really felt that the Labour Party, even under Corbyn, were an existential threat to Jews. I thought it was much more complicated than that. Like an existential, because we have to be careful with language here. Yeah. So the Nazi Party are an existential threat to Jews. Right? And one of the points about my book is these are people who don't even understand a lot of time when they're being anti-Semitic. 
they have to be shown and explained to them how they're being anti-Semitic. A lot of the time, it's not direct anti-Semitism, it's absence, it's failure to help, failure to comfort, failure to see where blah, blah, blah. And although, and those things are all really bad and they lead in the end to really bad anti-Semitism because I think that you need the left, you need the left and you need progressives to see anti-Semitism so they can fight the far right. They can fight the people with Camp Auschwitz on their t-shirt who are saying the Jews will not replace us in America. Those are real people and those are a real threat. So that's what you see what I'm saying. I, I don't think I, do. I, I don't think the Labour Party under Corbyn for all the differences about it. I don't think they're the existential threat. The existential threat is still the far right. It's the, the fact that there is no bulwark, yeah. no defence provided by the left. That's the problem. I see. I go a step further than that, because one of the things that was so awful over the last period of time, when it was in the papers every day, is how vulnerable Jews became full stop. Mm. And that we know that there was a spike in physical hate crime. Oh, no, I, where I, it came I, from, and that's you. Yeah. So it did... And that's where I where I both disagree and agree, because I, where I completely agree is it's not about Israel, because we are British Jews living in the UK and and British anti-Semitism has become a thing, a thing that is now acceptable to be talk, talked about. The, um, and you're right, it didn't come out of the blue. It, this, is, this has been a growing issue, but you know, the questioning the role of Jews in society and validity and dual loyalties and some of the tropes mm. that all became as if that was an acceptable conversation yeah no I and agree. that has made us more vulnerable yeah i'm not i mean, I'm giving an example of something from the right but it involves a labor party we should probably go back to questions but i just want to tell you this i, I won't say who it is but a, quite a well-known person who has a talk show on the radio right-wing person and I, I, one of the things about the book is that quite, i've had quite a lot of invites from sort of right of centre or right wing things, right wing podcasts, trying to use my book as a sort of totem to beat the left with. And for me, it's not that either. You know, it's a critique of the left, but I don't, I don't see it as a sort of thing in the culture wars. I hate all that. If for me, it's a conversation, it's a complicated conversation, but I will go and speak to some of those people. Anyway, I was being asked on one of those shows, I decided not to do it anyway. And this person tells me in a direct message about how she was surprised, I've given away the gender now, um, because she knew this Labour Party MP and she really liked him and he was a really nice person, she said, but he once admitted to her that he was uncomfortable around Jews. And I said in the direct message, that is not a nice person. This is what you need to understand. Yeah. It's saying to me, he was a lovely person, he just had this thing that he was uncomfortable around Jews. That's a blind spot of yours because you would never say that about someone who said I just can't bear black people but he was a nice person that doesn't that makes no sense anymore correctly in the way we think about racism but somehow or other she could say that also but also what was a Labour MP with those views being a Labour MP in the first place <laughs> amazing, um, I know amazing anyway sorry let's let's, yeah. let's go back to um, that. okay yeah. it is um uh so I'm gonna do one final question from the chat and then a question that I have so um, okay, David, what are your feelings about when someone refers to anti-Semitism when, res uh, when responding to a Jew talking about left anti-Semitism? My feelings are that it is belittling of our experiences of anti-Semitism and could be interpreted as being anti-Semitic. Sorry, what are we talking about now? The, the inverted commas? The inverted commas, <laughs> which has become a thing. So, yeah. is, that, is that a thing? Well, yeah. you get this thing sometimes quite a lot which is one of the most annoying things in the world in this conversation so be aware as i'm sure everyone it would be and you certainly would be of the amount of bad faith things that people say just to win stupid arguments on twitter so one of the things that, that you see a lot is if you refer to anti-semitism someone will say well semites aren't jews anyway they're arabs and all sorts of people are semites you like yes you know what it means you know what it means and if you want i'll say anti-jewish racism but you know everyone agrees that anti-semitism is you know anti-jewish racism so that's annoying um when someone says anti-semitism i presume that's a labor person who is someone who thinks it's all smears and it never existed or whatever uh, i mean one of the things that is really annoying about that is i noticed that what they tend to do <laughs> Those people is they'll say it was all smears and it, you know it was all weaponized by the Tories or whatever and then they'll say and it diminishes the struggle against real anti-semitism and I always want to say 
at what point, by the way, would you recognize real anti-Semitism? Because there's all this stuff that Jews are saying they're unhappy with, but you're dismissing all that as smears. So I'd like to know what you think real anti-Semitism is. Is it just genocide? Is that the only thing that counts? You know, because it's a really extraordinary thing. They always bring it up as like the real, what real anti-Semitism. And I always think like, what, who's defining that? You yeah, they mean them. Nazis. They mean the far right and Nazis. But they just like, mean that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I think one of the most shocking testimonies that went through is that there was um uh there was far right material that was distributed at a uh, labor party event um and it had been it was a bmp leaflet as the, as fact like a really old school proper nazi jews run the world stuff and um i mean how the labor party dealt with it was appalling like they asked the jewish person who'd seen it why she'd be offended by it as part of the evidence testimony but it just showed the circle that we'd gone on, that you know, the certain members of the Labour Party thought it was appropriate, that there was valid messaging in a far-right leaflet. Yeah, well, yeah. That is a, that's appalling. Joel, a guy called Joel Brannold, who is on Twitter, told me, he's a Labour Party person, he was, told me that he was at an NEC meeting that was a few years ago, and this wasn't a right-wing thing, that there had been an information or educational leaflet going around conference or whatever about the Holocaust, and it mentioned all the groups yep. that were targeted by the Holocaust, and it included gays and Roma and disabled people and communists and trade unions, and it didn't mention Jews, no. right? And it's a trade union leaflet. Huh? It's a trade union leaflet. Yeah. And yeah. what is incredible about that is I, I'm prepared to accept that the people doing that are not just straightforward anti-Semites, that they think they're doing something worthwhile, because I think they think well, I think it's important to draw attention to the other people who were killed at the time. And obviously it is, but not if you miss out the primary target, then you're doing something really weird and violent and whatever. And then there's this other thing, which is definitely there on the left. Someone said it the other day, which is people say, well, you know, if you accept this idea of Jews as this victimized ethnic minority, blah, blah, blah you're siding with the Nazis because that's how they described you. And like, no, that, that's said by someone who has never had racism against them. The luxury of choice. You could say with a fucking gun pointed at you on the way to a mass grave, well, I don't accept your definition. Like, <laughs> fuck off, basically. Well, hey, come yeah. yeah. That a hundred times that. Okay, it's um, three minutes to five, so I'm going to do the last question. And um, given it's World Book Day, and undoubtedly lots of people have been homeschooling, you have written several books for young people. Yeah, look, I've got them if you want to plug them here. Okay, I we'll did plug a, them too. Go yes, on. Yesterday, I did a conversation <laughs> with a school uh, on, on Zoom. So they're all here, all my children's books. Do go and buy them, parents. Why don't you write one about anti Semitism, a children's book? Uh, a few people have asked me that. Um, well, my books aren't like that, my children's books. No. I mean, they have kind of moral lessons in them, but they're mainly just fun stories. Um, and I, I would never write something, I would never write something in fiction in general that was just a, a moral lesson or an educational lesson, because that's not the job of fiction, of storytelling. I, I'm happy to, people to, kids particularly to read, say, Taylor Turbo Chaser, which is my book about a disabled girl who transforms her, cut her wheelchair into a great supercar and maybe get a positive idea of disabled people from that. But yeah. to be honest with you, it's just a fun story and I hope they pick up that message. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to write a really boring book about you should be more positive about disabled people. I'm going to write a fun story. So with this book, this is a polemic. It's a serious piece, although it's got some jokes in it, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but it's a serious piece, piece uh, of, you know, socio-political thinking and it's not for children as a result it's young teenagers i would love to read it but children no uh i've written in my books there is stuff about racism and there is stuff about um you know diversity and whatever i don't know i i mean if i could say one more thing you know i'm very proud of this book and i'm very pleased to be you know someone who speaks a little bit and you do as well and other people do uh, about Jewish identity and it's taken a long time in this country for that to be a thing uh, that the Jewish community even have any voice at all but I also don't want to just be Britain's Mr Jew. No. 
I can understand I wanna, that. I want to do some other things as well. <laughs> I think that was um, is a I think that's a lovely point to finish on. I'm when I went into Parliament, I was a Labour Party MP who happened to be Jewish. Yeah. And then I became the Jewish MP. Exactly. And I would ne- um, and I, sa- I said it to Corbyn, you will rue the day you made me the Jewish MP. You think that that was going to silence me. Mm. Um, but, you know, we are, sometimes you're put where you've got to have the fight, but it is really nice when you can also be you too. Yes, exactly. No, I agree with that. Um, All right, Ruth. Are we, are we... I think we're done. Uh, Danny, are you back? There you I, go. I am. Um, was there anyone I... else on this? Because it, it felt like it was just me and Ruth having a chat. But... No, people were people were there. <laughs> I can guarantee people were there. Um, thank you. Thank you both. It was hugely interesting, entertaining at points, uh, learned a lot. Um, but also, David, you talked about Shifting the Dial, your book Shifting the Dial. And um, I can think of no more impressive um, thing to do than when you have a platform to use it to shift the dial in a positive way. Um, So thank you and well done. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, David, for giving your time. Thank you, Ruth. And um, thank you, everyone who joined us. And I thanks a lot, Ruth. Thanks, Danny. I love and keep safe, everybody. Yeah, keep safe. Lots of love.